Welcome to the Tough Fish Show. I am so excited to bring to you Stephen Joseph. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a great to be here. I'm so glad you are here. And I would love for you to start by telling me how'd you get into writing? Well, I got into writing actually uh, many years ago. It was uh, 1995. Uh, I'm an attorney. And of course, we write anyway. Uh, but what really got me into the mindset of writing, uh, I was asked to be a speaker uh, at a practicing law institute seminar. And I said, oh, great, I'll, I'll be speaking. And I was happy about that. And then the person who asked me said, well, could you write two chapters for the textbook? And I go, write, write two chapters? What, are you kidding me? You know. Uh, I, I, write to that stuff uh but then it just came naturally i started writing and he and actually he told me uh he said uh this this attorney dan goldwasser he said steve if you ever want to be an expert about anything just write about it and uh, i took that to heart and uh and really it, it's really the mindset when i start writing it's almost like the mindset of being an ex i want to be an expert on this uh, and even when I, I'm as an attorney, I'm writing out, uh, I'm given a lot of information and I like to write out this the information back to me because I want to be the expert on that particular case. So I do the same thing over and over again. So that's how I started on writing and uh, I do a lot of negotiation. So I would write a lot of articles on negotiation uh, and uh, even shared the dispute resolution committee with the ABA, American Bar Association. And I put together a book on negotiation. So this is before my other career as a children's author or uh, what my book on crankiness. So, so that came a lot later. Okay, but that's now, my, how I started on my writing career. Okay, now path. you said something just really funny right then that your next part, like writing your book on crankiness, but you just said that you write to like kind of become an expert. I don't think you want to be an expert in crankiness, <laughs> do you? No, I do. I do want to become an expert on crankiness. I love that uh, so it, much. And, uh, you know, and actually for, the, for an attorney, uh, I'm actually 60 years old. I turned 60 just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, the thing, uh, being an attorney and I manage other attorneys, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. And when you start out uh, working with other attorneys, everything that somebody says, it's like, wow, that's really interesting. And, and uh, you're learning, you're, I'm always learning. And now I'm actually older than most of the people I deal with. So it's like my eyes start rolling out of my head and it's like, oh, and, and uh, it really, that's why, you know, you have these grumpy old men, um, we, you get grumpy. I mean, because you, you see everybody else, no, 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 it's this way, it's that way. So you, you have to keep guiding and guiding. So yes, yeah, so uh, because I find myself cranky, I have to become a crankiness expert and I have to be effectively cranky as opposed to just ineffectively cranky. <laughs> I really love that. I love that you chose to take that and make it fun, you know, because I know you're humorous too, but you've made it fun and you've made it to something where how can you kind of help yourself but help other people too? Because everybody has bouts of crankiness. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're going to run into it. No. You're going to be cranky. It's yourself too at times. So it happens. I say there's a 100% infection rate. And, and I talk about you know, the, the thing about it, we, we talk about the common cold and why it's called the common cold, because you might get one or two every year. Uh, and I call what, what the cranky thing, a cranky surus, surus being the Yiddish word for problems. Uh, you could get two or three just in the morning. You know, you're getting the kids ready for school. The train is late. Your boss is texting you, whatever. You know, you're, you're a whole bunch of crankosaurus. So it's a common crankosaurus. And by making it common, it's like, okay, this, this is it's more something you could deal with. So now to your point that uh, Soros is in, 
referring a problem. How big of a problem does it need to be? Well, uh, I think it, it's, when I, well, in my kid's book, uh, I kind of joke around. It's like a Soros is not like just any ordinary problem. A Soros is like something you have to tell the entire world. Uh, so, uh, so there's a big difference. But in reality, when I'm talking about a crankosaurus, it could be anything. It could be anything that just just sets you off, and uh, and you just want to, I, I say, embrace it, not try to get rid of it. Just say, acknowledge it and say, yeah, it's, it's there. And then once you, you're not trying to get rid of it, uh, it, it's actually easier to just like look at and slow it down, and and okay. I'll, I'll get through this and move on. I like that. I think that is so cool. So what was it like? So first off, Crankosaurus, you've got it for children, but you also have an adult version to help adults deal with their sauruses too. So, yes. so, but what was it like writing for the kids first? Well, the, the kids book actually was uh, it was very quick. It was just, uh, it was like a story. Uh, how, how that happened is that I was with my wife in Rome and we're jet lagged and tired. And we rented out this Airbnb two bedroom bath, two bathroom place, which she has her own bathroom, which is always good. Recommend two bathrooms. On. So, uh, so uh, the thing was, it's the summer, it's hot. And, and she was coloring her hair and, and, um, the black hair dye is going in her eye and electricity goes out at the same time. So now it's completely dark in there and she's blind uh, and <laughs> I can't see. And so she was cr uh, cranky and she was like that non-consolable crankiness thing going on. So finally, it just came out of my mouth that uh, she was being a tyrannical crankosaurus. And I even then said, that's probably how all the other dinosaurs died. There's this one little dinosaur who kept cranking out her saurus till all the bigger dinosaurs just dropped dead. And, and that kind of got a laugh in her and, and it kind of calmed, down, it calmed everything down. But then what happened afterwards uh, was that whenever we would feel cranky, we, we gave it a name, a crankosaurus. And by giving it a name, it kind of like, okay, I feel it's coming on. Uh, I could give you a warning or like if I didn't hold the brakes on to, I just, I just happen to have a crank of sores. And it, it makes it softer. It's just like, okay. Uh, so, uh, so that, that got me. And all of a sudden I had the story, the dinosaur story, like a few months later that I just wrote. And I read it, the story and people laughed. And uh, I thought, well, this would be a good kid's book. And I started looking pu for publishers and uh, I, I found uh, mascot books. There's a couple others, but I picked mascot. Uh, and uh, it was great. Like th they provided like 75 different illustrators and I could pick and choose the top three I like. And out of those three, they would give me, I picked the one I liked the best because they would give me a lot of their material. So, uh, I had the one that I really wanted to work with. And that was a blast because then you collaborate. We have the story blocks for the kid's story. And then you, you describe what you see in every picture. And uh, my illustrator, Andy Case, who I have now for the, the second book, uh, he just was like spot on. He was just really, well, once in a while, I would say, well, I want this a little, or you know, we, make, we make changes. and. And then, you know, it just gets a lot better. I love that, though, because I think the story is charming. It's just so sweet. It's so cute. You can just feel the, the life. And then this little dinosaur, she's super cute. Yes, yes. She's so adorable. And you just sit there and chuckle because you're thinking to yourself, oh, yeah, I could be that little dinosaur at times, too. Or I've seen that dinosaur show up in this other situation. And it's just... She's so cute. Yeah. And the funny thing about with the illustrator, with Andy, uh, you know, how it ends up millions of years later, all humans evolved from the Tyrannosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus. 
And uh, so like I wanted this picture of the planet with all different babies crying. And he had actual, actually had a couple babies laughing. No, they're crying. They have to be crying. That's how like when we come out, we're cranky. The first moment that we enter this world, we're cranky. That's the whole point. So, but he got it right. I yeah. love it. I love it. And so what was that like working with your illustrator? I mean, I, I love that you got a sample or samples to look at that you all had communications you can tell and that it sounds like your illustrator really kind of got, you know, like really understood what you wanted to convey and the way in which you wanted to convey it, because you can do illustrations in a whole lot of different ways. So it sounds like you both, you really came together as a good team. Are there some tips that you would have to an author who wants to work with an illustrator, what to consider? Uh, well, I, the, the first time around I was a novice and it really helped me uh, that the publisher provided so many illustrators, like about 75, a lot of stuff <laughs> to go through. And uh, a lot of it was kind of too, like, too dry, too, you know, just uh, uh, some of them was like more like, like, like sweet, like, like teddy bearish kind of thing. And I wanted a little bit louder. And, uh, and Andy pretty much had the, uh, you know, the kind of feeling I wanted to get up front. So so uh, that was a big advantage. Then, like I see, people, there's a lot of Facebook groups afterwards, and they're looking for illustrators. And you could just you're only looking at one. You sign up with one illustrator, and that's the one illustrator. Uh, and that might not be a good match. You don't know. You just like you're just looking at the price. This illustrator could do it for X dollars. It sounds good, uh, but it might not be a good match. Uh, so I could tell you, uh, for my second book, kids book, I went directly to Andy, uh, direct without the publisher and he charges, you know, you go direct to the, to the illustrator. He, they charge a lot less than the publisher adds on a fee, uh, that, uh, at least this time around, I don't have to pay. Cool. Yeah. So it sounds like but it sounds like the sampling really was instrumental in helping you because without seeing the, the 75 different samples or different artists, yeah. that really yeah. helps to be able to do that. So if you're able to ask the illustrator for a sample, if you haven't seen it in conjunction with your work, I think that that would add a lot of value. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. So how did you transition to writing an, a book for adults? Well, how again, everything was by accident. I didn't plan on writing the kids' book. It just <laughs> happened. And I didn't plan on writing the adult book. So uh, after I wrote The Last Surviving Dinosaur, uh, I started this website for the book. It was the last, at the time, it was the www.thelastsurvivingdinosaur.com. And uh, I didn't know. I was just suggested to do a website. Okay, I'm gonna do the website thing. And uh, somebody wrote a review uh, on that book that it didn't talk enough about overcoming crankiness. So it was a criticism. And I, and I thought, uh, no, I wanted to embrace crankiness. It was, it was just like, no, we're all cranky and we have to embrace it. Uh, so, uh, so I started this blog and I didn't know where it was gonna go. And, and I just came up with like little stories and little things on crankiness, on, on about embracing crankiness uh, until I got about like 25. And then I started thinking, hey, I could put together a book. And I got my publisher hooked up at chapter 25. And then, and then I actually got a publicist as well uh, who helped me give me thoughts for additional writing. And uh, then I had like 41 and I stopped at 41 uh, as, as for the book. 
and I have another 23 on top of that. So, uh, so that could be like uh, Grown Up Guide 2, book number two, or just make it a second edition, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but it, it's amazing how much material there is on, on crankiness. On, uh, and, and, it's, and, and I have different sections. There's, there's having a voice, like there's empowerment. There's just strategies for when you're cranky, how to deal with it. Uh, I have even uh, like just fun stuff like cooking. I like to cook, so uh, I have a, a Crankosaurus cooking class on my website or uh, in the book I talk about like making uh, p potato latkes, which are pancakes. So uh, because that that's a, a cure to, uh, uh, and then I even have the other side, my most recent blog is Fetchers in the Rye. Uh, and, uh, and, and that talks like my father would always, we go to this deli and, and when he was older and, and uh, in assisted living, we would order, he would order, order the same thing, corn beef sandwich, he wants it juicy. And it was never juicy. So, and, and we also asked her to, the rye bread without seeds. Uh, of course, they brought it seeds. And my father's wearing dentures. And then he has to take his teeth out of his mouth and put it on the table with this chewed up, as if we're staring at his teeth with the mustard and the corned beef and the, and the caraway seeds and the rye bread stuff. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> but then, but then, and then the thing about that, so I talk about like all sorts of like, how food gets us cranky. Sometimes food is the cure for a cranky source, but sometimes it's the cause of it and uh, how it starts when we're little. And the, the one most wonderful thing, I love when, I, when something just falls on your lap and it's just, this is funny. So one of the first uh, baby foods they had out in the market was liver soup baby food. Liver soup, can you imagine? Uh, and how they advertised it, they said it was pleasingly bland. Like two words I never thought could go together. Pleasingly Either. bland. Ew. Ew. <laughs> Yuck. So, <laughs> Can't even. Oh my gosh. So, so I even have like a fun with in, in my blog. Uh, like I have like a little conversation where like this guy is like, oh, how was your hot date last night? Well, she was great. She was pleasingly bland. And well, what did she say about you? She, well, she said I was bland. Was she? What did she say you were pleasingly bland? Uh, no, she just mentioned something about liver soup. You know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But so. So. <laughs> I was just going to say that I love the fact that you weave in Yiddish. I love the fact uh -huh. that you weave in like storytelling because your blog does include stories. It's not, it is, it's teaching through stories and it's just, but it's relatable. Every, the stories help people to see themselves. And just like the last little dinosaur, she's, she, she's showing that that can happen too, but just to help a child see that that can happen just as much to them or around them as it does to the grown ups too. I love that it's a grown up guide. <laughs> So yes, cool. yes, it's definitely a grown-up guy. Grown-ups need it more than the kids. You know, <laughs> good point. <laughs> uh, so now I know that you are a humorist and a marathon runner. So how do those type of things also show up in your books? Because just like you said, there's a love of a love of cooking. Obviously, Yiddish shows up, which I love that too. But how does running and how do how does the humorous side of you? How do those start to show up in your books? Because I love how how the different parts of you are showing up in different ways in your books. Like they're still reaching, you're reaching your odd, your appropriate audiences, but you're leveraging all of the things that make you, you to show up in each of them. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, well, with the running, what happens is a lot of my writing happens when I run, I'll go out for like a two hour run and, and just uh, characters start talking or I, I'm reminded about uh something uh, growing up that I could use. It's, it's always the growing up stuff. So, uh, and, uh, or like my daughter's 26, she's already grown, but uh, so like uh, I would write, 
I have a timeout crankosaurus. And I remember when my daughter was little, we put her in timeout. And, and I was thinking about my, my growing up with uh, my house. It wasn't like, actually it wasn't a timeout. It was time in. Like, so come sit with the family and watch Lawrence Walt show. Yeah. And, or uh, uh, my mother would say, Stevie, do you feel like taking me to the beauty parlor? And, uh, and it's like, oh, yes. Like, my friends wanted me to go out, play with them, and the, play baseball today or go to the pool. But no, the beauty parlor on a hot summer day. And we didn't have a car. We had to take the, the, the 17 bus through the Bronx to get to Allentown Avenue. So my mother is sitting on that with that thing for like three hours, you know, and I just have to stay, stand there waiting for my mother to be done with her hair. Yeah, yes, of course. Yes, I feel like taking you. So it's like, it's, it's more like time in. You, you want to get somebody to behave. You give them a time in, not a time out. So it's just like, so it was, it's funny, those kind of stories. Uh, was the time in where, you know, back then, uh, we didn't have remote control. And then uh, my father would, like, I would have to be by the TV to change the channel. So that was another, like, time in. I love that, though. I think that that is so, so cool. So what guidance would you have for someone who is interested in writing for multiple audiences like this? So you have, basically, you have a nonfiction for adults, and it's, it is under the same umbrella. It's still about embracing, owning and embracing and recognizing crankiness, but you're writing for different audiences. You're writing for different consumers and for different mm -hmm. intentions in some way. Do you have some guidance as to how to make that transition to go from one audience to another like that? Well, uh, I, I think with, with what I did, it, it really is the same. It, it really, it's not much difference uh, except uh, uh, the, uh, the stories tend to be, uh, some stories tend to be more ge geared towards kids. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's just how the stories turn out. So I, I'll write, even now on my blog, I'll write something uh, where just the, the idea was like, like, like barely scratching the surface. That was just only thought, barely scratching the surface. And, uh, and then I, it grew into this story, which actually became a kid's story, uh, which is my next book, Snoodles, Poodles, Kadoodles, and Lots and Lots of Noodles. Uh, <laughs> I love that. But, uh, uh, which I'm very excited about because the story, that, I just tell you, this, this story is about this guy, uh, Herbie Snoodleman, who invented the snoodle, which ran on noodles. And before that, everybody was driving around in the Krautmobile, which ran pretty much on sauerkraut. And everybody <laughs> would be getting very stinky and smelly and cranky. And uh, there's even like a, a picture, uh, like they're at the botanical gardens and you have kids wearing masks. So it has this COVID pandemic feel to it. And, uh, and then like, of course, at the end, there's this post-pandemic deal where everyone's out and celebrating. Uh, he ends up uh, opening up the Snoodle Cadoodle Noodle Art Museum. And then there's the Noodle Lisa, which is this Mona Lisa in noodles. And everybody uh, came, came to see this. But then Sauerkrudel, who was the inventor of the Krautmobile, came in and sprayed sauerkraut on the Noodle Lisa which then had to get restored. And so they went to Pierre Latoodle, the art restoration guy, and he happened to have poodles who end up helping out restoring the art because they love sauerkraut. So it's uh, just, you know, that's the, the kind of the story and then things end up happily ever after. But, uh, but yeah, that's, it's, just, it's just what happens, where it goes. And, and uh, I wrote, uh, uh, the, the grown-up book is is a self-help book, and, and uh, but a funny self-help book, and I wanted to write it in a way 
I was married to a therapist for 20 years and now I got remarried. I'm with another therapist for 10 years. And uh, my first wife had me read all these self-help books. And a lot of them were written by psychologists and then they're reading, writing their greatest hits. And they have one good thought and in the first chapter. And it seems like every chapter, it's the same. I, did I read this already? You know, it's just, it, my book is different. It, keep, it talks about a different thing. And the stories, and I actually uh, uh, wrote an article uh, that uh, the best self-help book is the best thing, the advice on writing a self-help book is writing a good uh, bedtime story. And, and saying bedtime stories are not just for kids, they're for grownups as well. So I, I have that kind of attitude when I'm, I'm writing uh, for the adults, the, uh, to, to give them a story, but to help them figure out something they can relate to, uh, that I'm not, I'm not talking down to them, saying you should be like this, or whatever. It, it's like just telling a story and then they can relate to it. It's like, yeah, that happens to me too. And, you know, again, you have your own stories that you learn so much and you could keep it to yourself or, or uh, you could write it down and share. And so that's, that's what I try to do. But it also helps people to see that they're not alone. I mean, if you feel like you've just been cranky or you're dealing with so much crankiness or maybe there's a specific situation that you know each time you run into it you're just frustrated like going to the deli and for they seem to keep having the caraway seeds on the rye bread okay you know so if you already know that you're you're going to deal with something like that it helps to see yourself in a in somebody else's in a book that you've picked up because somebody else is saying, I get you. <laughs> I've been there too. This is a way that I over I overcame it, but I overcame it by, in this case, not pushing it aside by saying, Oh, so this is what it is. Okay, this is how I deal. This is how I can accept it and keep moving forward and recognize that it either it is what it is, or maybe it was okay after all, or I just needed to know that I wasn't the only one. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. I love that so much. Stephen, this has been so much fun. I've been trying to stifle my chuckling in some ways because your stories were really cute. <laughs> so it's nice to be able to just totally chuckle at this point. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for being on this show. Where can people connect with you and where can they get the books? Well, uh, my my blog and and it's, it's a fun blog. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just when you in, in you, ha you have your favorites and uh, that uh, they just get better. Uh, so you can get my book through my uh, website, stephenjosephauthor.com. You could go on to Amazon and you can find either a grown up guide to effective crankiness, the crankosaurus method. You can find the last surviving dinosaur, both on Amazon or in many other, you go on to Walmart or Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, any of those sites would be carrying my book. My grown-up guide uh, is also on Audible, and there's this fabulous actor who reads the book, and uh, I love it because I, I hear him reading it, and, and I crack up, and then I feel like it's, it's, I didn't even write it. It's not me. It's someone else wrote it, uh, because what happens is that you know any author, uh, they have their favorites. There are things like, oh, man, why did I put that in? You know, and then he's reading it. Even the stuff I didn't like, I crack up. Uh, not that like I didn't like it, but you know, it made the book. But but it's not my favorite. Like this stuff is like, oh, that's good. Uh, and then other stuff, it's like, well, it makes the point, you know. So I'm gonna keep it. But when he reads it, it's it. So the Audible, it's on Audible, and you could get the Audible version on Amazon.com, or there's an Audible version on Barnes and Nobles as well. And when does the new book come out? I think late fall, uh, it's still in the, in the drafting. I get pictures all the time and then we have to put everything together. Uh, and then I might have like, uh, some changes to some of the pictures and, uh, my illustrator who's from Nottingham, England. So it's, he's across the pond and he, he, you know, he's, he's great. Uh, 
So uh, late fall, uh, hopefully ready for uh, Christmas time. Awesome. Awesome. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been so much fun. Well, thank you for having me.